Greetings, everybody, wherever you are and wherever you're listening in from. It's an immense pleasure for me to moderate this session. Now, we've already been hearing a lot about issues of uh, access and inclusion um, throughout this conference yesterday, as well as the sessions uh, today. But today, we in, in our session, we hope to go a little bit deeper. And we know that student mobility and global experiences in education have always been a somewhat of an elite phenomenon. And even though there are 5 million students globally mobile, now that number has, of course, dropped a little bit due to the pandemic, even though 5 million students are mobile, and that sounds like a very large number, the reality is that that's a very small proportion of students who are actually able to avail of global knowledge and global experiences in um, in education. And we are now well into the second year of the pandemic. And it can be argued both ways, where one argument is that technology has possibly opened doors and increased access, especially for those who could not actually be physically mobile, or it can be argued, and indeed has also been shown, that technology could possibly create greater divides and greater, uh, greater inequities and sharpening divides between those who are able to access such opportunities. Against this backdrop, our panel will address some fundamental issues of access and inclusion in global education. What are some efficient and cost-effective strategies that higher education institutions can use to internationalize, as well as looking at a really growing and important conversation around social justice and higher education. I'm delighted to share that we have a very eclectic panel representing different sectors and areas of expertise. But before I introduce them, let me go ahead and share some quick logistics of how we're going to spend our time together. So after introductions, we will spend about 25 to 30 minutes in discussion um, where I'm going to pose some key questions to our uh, panelists. And then following which, we will take questions from you all for the remaining 15 to 20 minutes. As you hear the discussions and as ideas come to you, whether those are questions or comments, please put them in the chat box because these will be shared with me and I will uh, raise them with our panelists. And now, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists one by one. Um, first, we have Maria Moidin Ahmed, who is the founder and director of the Social Innovation Lab in Pakistan and has also been an International Youth Foundation Fellow. The Social Innovation Lab enables change makers to build sustainable social enterprises create ecosystems that support social innovation and push for human-centered policy making at the highest levels. As part of this effort, it also runs the Hatchery, an early stage social enterprise incubator. Welcome, Mariam. Thank you. Let me now introduce Phil Beatty, who is Chief Knowledge Officer at Times Higher Education that many of us are, of course, familiar with. An award-winning journalist, Phil joined THE in 1996 and has served in many roles since then, ranging from chief reporter to editor at large. Phil has worked extensively on the THE rankings and has been called, quote, one of the most powerful commentators and arguably policy actors on higher education. So welcome, Phil. Our third speaker is Rebecca Morgenstern Brenner, who is a lecturer and part of the teaching faculty at the Cornell Institute for Public Affairs at Cornell University. Rebecca teaches classes, most with surface learning components on topics such as disaster policy, environmental policy, environmental justice, project management and design thinking. She has won many awards and recognitions for her work and is also an Atkinson Sustainable Future Faculty Fellow and an engaged Cornell Faculty Fellow. So welcome, Rebecca. And lastly, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Adele Elzaim, who has taken on, has just taken on his new role as Vice President, and you have a long title, Vice President for Research, Creation, Partnership and Internationalization at the University of Quebec in Canada. 
and prior to this has served in senior international roles at several other institutions, including most recently the University of Ottawa. Adele is also immediate past president of the US-based Association of International Education Administrators, or AIEA, and is chairing the upcoming 2022 conference in Louisiana. Originally from Lebanon, Adele's work has also straddled both North America and uh, the MENA region. So with that, let me welcome all of you, and I'm sure our listeners will agree that this is, uh, this is an uh, incredible uh, panel that we have. So I want to start with sort of a question to um, each of you, and then subsequently we may dive into some strands that are specific to you. But you know, as I as I shared in the framing, we are le we are living in a time of um, increasing issues of lack of access, inclusion, so social justice, and diversity, where these issues have really become front and center in education in the past um, few years, um, and this has happened globally. And the question has really been raised: that how do we continue to prepare students as uh, global citizens? Um, at the same time, in this past year, primarily due to the pandemic, we've also learned that change is really the only constant, and so things are continuing to evolve. So against this background of global shifts, of significant socioeconomic shifts that we've seen um, across the world, what are your thoughts on whether these developments have increased? or decreased access to um, to education. So with that sort of, it's like a broad um, question to get us started. Um, let me turn to you, Phil, um, to maybe get your thoughts uh, on that and, 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 and kick us off with that. Thank you very much, uh, Rajika. Yeah, I mean, obviously we have a, a, big, a big problem that, that the pandemic has not only highlighted the really quite terrible levels of social injustice, the terrible divides in our societies and the growing inequalities. It's also exacerbated that, of course, you've seen, you know, particularly communi particular communities more badly affected. Uh, there are people who are riding the pandemic financially okay. There are others who are absolutely struggling to make ends meet. So we, we've deepened the inequalities. My sense is that universities do have this extraordinary moment to, to play their role in ad addressing that, in tackling that. Um, on one level, it is simply about being more accessible. I think all the disruption that will come from the pandemic uh, could be turned into many positive aspects, particularly around um, looking at ways to allow people to access higher education without necessarily the, the resources, the means to jump on an airplane, to relocate, to pay the, um, the, the, the typically high tuition expenses you've come to see in certain markets. So I think there's a, there's a potential, I think, for a democratization of of access to international higher education and, and also at the domestic level as well i think one level i think the international student mobility flows will, will change a little bit we've seen that typical sense that aspirational middle class people in in, in primarily east nations east asian nations or, or sub global south nations seeking to study uh, in the west in the global north and I think there might be some shift there. I don't think it'll be dramatic disruption, but I think that people have seen now that as those borders have closed, as those uh, opportunities have potentially stopped, there's more east-to-east -east circulation, there's more south-south circulation. I think there'll be less of a sort of more traditional flow of talent, less of a brain drain, more of a brain circulation can be possible. And I think very much will be, particularly if you've seen on top of some of the travel restrictions and the cost restrictions, also you've seen some growing nationalisms and growing hostility that's made some receiving nations seem a little bit less welcoming, for example, in uh, the United States and, and in the UK, where I'm coming from. Um, so on top of that shift, which I hope will democratize access and, and, and mean it's not just a brain drain or, or a, 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 an opportunity for pri more privileged or more um, socially uh, mobile individuals, but also the, the, the simple fact that we've we've embraced some new technologies. We've embraced uh, the opportunity to study without getting on airplanes, without relocating. The, the technologies, I think, are genuinely opening up, opening up opportunities. There are, are, of course, real concerns about the access to broadband, the access to facilities, the access to 
a suitable home working environment or a remote working environment, they're really important issues. But generally speaking, the cost of visas, the prohibitive nature of applying for visas, the, um, the financial realities of jumping on airplanes, I think we're able to show we can provide access to great universities all over the world to people in a much more eco-friendly and a much more cost-friendly way. Um, so as a starter for 10, that's my sense. It's an opportunity that universities much must seize to put themselves at the heart of a great leveling, an equi-covery, as I've heard it being described, not just a recovery, an equi-covery. That is, that is a very interesting um, uh, turn of phrase there. So thank you for that. Um, I, uh, maybe we'll move um, uh, to Mariam and then Rebecca to hear your thoughts on this broad question and Adele that come back to you. And I know Mariam and Rebecca, you're both um, working more directly with uh, young students and Mariam, particularly you, you're working with youth populations. So how does this sort of broad question resonate uh, with you and, and what are some of your, your thoughts around this? Well, we need to see universities as anchor institutions, right, which have a significant role to play in the communities that they're embedded in. Um, one of our partners, the Dalwan Network, which has over 370 universities across the world on its roster, one of the key things they talk about constantly is community engaged and community based partnerships that universities must, must, must follow. And um, we're seeing just incredible things coming out of that during COVID. Um, incubators that we set up at universities eventually ended up um, creating startups that would provide telemedicine, that would provide uh, food and um, access to food security during times of lockdowns. Uh, we found um, startups who we had supported in the e-commerce world completely switching their business to food delivery and uh, grocery delivery when folks were having a hard time uh, doing all of that. And so um, what we're seeing is two things. One, um, universities working with communities and two, young people taking responsibility and working on social impact startups within universities has had just a very positive impact during COVID. Um, the other piece we're seeing also, um, like Phil mentioned, is that the distances have become super small with uh, uh, digital platforms and students being able to um, attend classes on Zoom. I currently grade students in Singapore while sitting in Waterloo, Canada. And they're taking classes with uh, people from across the country here in Canada. And so there, there's this definite proof that you don't need to, you know, have a tremendous carbon footprint or spend a lot of money to be able to get access to similar, uh, you know, kind of knowledge. Um, but I think the most important piece that Phil mentioned that I really want to latch on to in this conversation is the equi recovery, uh, which is just so powerful a concept, right? Um, we, especially in Global South nations, somehow um, the UK, the US, Europe tend to be places where a lot of our students would would like to flock to, or, or um, there's a lot of um, advertisement and, and this whole movement to attract students to those places. And now we're seeing a shift where students are looking more regionally, more locally, um, and really exploring possibilities that enable a South to South um, trans sort of sort of transportation and learning and, and knowledge and wisdom sharing, honestly. So it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. It's very exciting. No, thank you for that. And I think that it's actually the the in uh, the the regional sort of flows that you allude to and that Phil also alluded to and more of the South South cooperation has actually been building over the past few years. And I think uh, the pandemic has really provided that final push um, for that to expand, uh, expand even even further. Rebecca, over over to you on uh, on uh, your thoughts uh, based on your work. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, uh, I agree with a lot of what Miriam and Phil said too. Um, I think that what we have right now is that we're faced with vulnerabilities in the community and what COVID-19 in particular has done uh, globally is make those really upfront in our, in our bases, right? And we're really faced right upfront with these vulnerabilities. And what we can do is we can choose to dig into what exposes us to what that vulnerability is and invest in how we can be more resilient in our global community. Um, and I agree with uh, Miriam that uh, seeing universities as anchor institutions and one way of, uh, of really digging in deeper into that is looking at those, I, I agree, community partnerships are where every university should be building in and investing in and connecting students with different members of the community because that's a great resource in, in addressing those vulnerabilities, but making sure that who's given access to those opportunities because it's often up to one or two people to say, okay, these are the people I know. And so I'm gonna reach out to the people I know and build those partnerships and making sure that those are more equitably, equitably distributed throughout the community um, I think that's a really important place that we can dig in deeper and be even more resilient is look at broadening those. Um, I think that this is all an opportunity to expand if we choose to take it that way and invest in things like global access to vaccine, um, invest in creating more equitable situations at the higher education level so they can be replicated in practice because, um, you know, like, when, when I'm in a classroom with students and teaching these things, they're learning and they're gonna replicate this in before we know it, in like a couple of years, they're gonna be out there doing these things and running these things. And so what we really need to do is be very upfront and open about how we're making decisions so that they can, first of all, give space to criticize those decisions and make those decisions better because I know I can always grow, we can always grow. And then let the students take have that opportunity to um, take into practice what we're doing in the classroom and hopefully expand those networks to be even more broader and inclusive. I think you make a really good point about um, access, not just to opportunities, but the individuals who are the, uh, the sort of gate, quote unquote, the gatekeepers or decision makers around those opportunities. And so very often for students, the challenge is um, not just sort of access to the opportunity itself and knowing more about that opportunity, but really how do you um, infiltrate or enter that network of, uh, of key decision makers, so dem democratizing that as well. Adele, over, over to you uh, for your perspective. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Rajika, and thank you all for sharing your perspective. I, I do agree uh, with you. I am as optimistic as you, but I think I have the duty now to disagree with you, just to give you another perspective, actually. You know, indeed, we are learning a lot from the pandemics. We are adapting a lot, and actually, we are still in transition. I think all higher education institutions are still in transition to something new, and the problem here is that I think we need, we have to invent this future. It's not enough to say new normal or life as it is. We, it's our responsibility to invent this future. Uh, however, I think it is very important for all of us to recognize that all students and all higher education institutions have not, don't have the same opportunity actually for access. Students, even in some developed countries, still have no access to a full internet uh, connections. They have no access to computers and uh, to technologies uh, from home. Uh, during the pandemics, actually, uh, libraries, as you know, they closed, even public libraries. And we watched some students, young students, studying in the street, even here in Canada, because they had no access to internet from home. So I think we need to be very uh, realistic too, and to agree that uh, it is not given to all of us, and I'm not talking about the whole you know, uh, planet, because we still have poor countries, we still have countries with difficulties, and even in some rich countries, even in Africa, we still have uh, students who in the schools and universities who have no uh, access to technology, they have no access to the uh, good knowledge 
But in the same time, the youth, they still want to travel. They still want to study abroad. They still want to connect with other universities. So I'm not ready to say uh, uh, they will study from their home and they will connect to the United States, except if we give them new facilities and new types of facilities and new types of relationship. And uh, this is why I, I, I say uh, we still need to invent a global education and uh, invent a new type of a global education, but uh, with keeping the borders open. And thank you for offering that um, that uh, contrasting perspective. And I and I agree with the last uh, one of the last points that you made. That I think the challenge, really, the, the challenge here is how to not um, sort of lapse into the convenience of technology and say that or believe that students who didn't have access earlier to more um, global to, to mobile experiences should now rely on technology, whereas the more traditional experience will continue to be available to those who can actually afford it. And, and if we if, if we veer in that direction, then we actually increase some of the divides that have uh, existed. So I think Absolutely. lots of complexities here. And I think what's clear from what you all said is that they that different models will um, will coexist. Um, so I want to dig a little bit deeper on um, looking looking at students, and then after that, broaden the conversation back to universities. So um, one of the one of the things that's become very evident to us in recent years is also the growing diversity of different types of learners and how to ensure access for different populations of uh, students. So, so I want to, um, and Rebecca, maybe we'll start with you. I want to ask this question that how can universities and educational institutions, and, and I want to broaden it not just to universities, because I think one of the key aspects here is also that transition from a secondary education to a post-secondary one. So when we think about students, how can universities and institutions reach more non-traditional students? And these could include working professionals. They could be working parents. They could be differently abled students. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that based on, um, on your work. Um, it's great. It's a great question. And, um, and I agree with Abel too that that everybody does not have a, a equitable access to Wi-Fi. I mean, and like here, I, I'm in the U.S. in Ithaca by Cornell University, and there are people within our community who don't have access to Wi-Fi um, and broadband. And that's a conversation in every town regionally. So I think this is a global access uh, issue, and that's one that needs to be tackled first because um, there's more and more access is uh, is limited to those people who have that, and that's that's a big gate. Um, so I, I really appreciate that point being uh, made too, and and echo it. Um, and and it makes it really hard because when we look at uh, at learners, there's there's a lot of different investment in those online collaborative tools that are really wonderful and can help reach some of the more diverse learners, but not if not everybody has access to it. So it's kind of a double edged sword. So we kind of do like we do need to first address access, and then once we do, there there are really great online tools to that can bring people in. Um, I'll share that in the classroom. That like when I'm in the classroom, one adaptation I've made that I found to be really helpful is that I used to only rely on people raising their hand and saying, "I have this idea. I want to share this idea," and um, and that person got to share that idea and that was brought into the discussion, but not everybody's comfortable with that. And when I say comfortable, I, I, I would even say not everybody can do that. That's just not in everybody's, like people can't do that. And so creating multiple ways for people to participate in discussion is really empowering. And it also allows for a transition for if you have to go online or if for some reason um, there was this, uh, like there's this idea that no matter what the show must go on in academia and it, it like you have to go through a snowstorm or well we're, we're snow so um you have to get through a snowstorm to get there but um having 
you know, for different learners, uh, you know, there's people with kids and parents and people who have access issues. So having your classroom environment that it can pivot to an online environment is one way you can do that, but not if everybody can get on. Um, and also making sure that any opportunity is just transparent to everyone who has access to them. Again, we have this idea of a student that they're this fully independent, overachieving person with no other responsibilities except for that attainable knowledge and they could drop everything for every opportunity. And that's just not the case. It's, it's just not who our learners are. And so providing different ways, times, opportunities to allow them to participate, um, different paces, because I find that some students need time to reflect before they're ready to speak. Um, they need time to approach opportunities um, if it only comes in an email once and uh, and that's the one way they can get it and they have to respond in this one way, that closes the door for a lot of people. And so just trying to, um, to look at all the different learners. And I guess I want to end with the one point of that we should ask them more. And I've gotten, I, I myself have put more time into asking students before doing things like, can everybody access this? And just putting that out there and giving multiple ways for them to respond so they don't have to scream it out in the class um, really has like shown me that every class is different in the way that they access the information. And so being ready to pivot a little is just very empowering. Absolutely. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Um, Phil, yes, let's go with you. I mean, just, just to really to completely agree with, with everything Rebecca said, but there's some great evidence, I think, of technology before the pandemic being used by universities like Georgia State to dramatically improve completion rates, to, to really um, reduce dropouts by helping to understand the individual learning journey to uh, target intervention, to make sure that the support is available at the right time. You know, it's quite controversial because it often means using a lot of data and, and possibly moving into the realms of um, you know, data security that makes some people feel uncomfortable, but actually monitoring campus activity, campus use, library use, uh, keystrokes, learning learning activities, areas where they get challenged. So the digital technology, I think, has a huge potential to do some really good things for access and inclusion. Um, so that's one level, I think, that the acceleration we've seen through the pandemic could be really positive. But I also think there is the more wider issue that the sort of cat is out of the bag, really, in terms of flexibility, student focused education. The pandemic has forced universities to be much more student focused. Um, all the university leaders we speak to at Times Higher Education, you know, we do we do uh, annual surveys of, of university presidents across the world. No one's saying they're going to go back to the way things were. The cliche is obviously the new normal, but the new normal, I think, would be blended. It will mean that there'll be in-person classes, but they will also be on-demand lectures. And even that alone, I think, does start doing exactly what Rebecca says. It means it can cater for students who might have caring responsibilities or part-time work to make ends meet, that they can access their education much more flexibly. Um, and I think that really starts to move towards the, the longer-term disruption we might see, which is you know, the rise of credit accumulation and transfer. I know in India, um, no one's quite managed to crack it, but the idea in India now in the in the major, major um, national education reforms is to build a, a, a really good, solid system where you can take your credit and move it around. You can dip in and dip out. You know, we've seen lots of hype around micro credentials, but can we take this really awful pandemic and bring out as many of the positives to offer that flexibility, to offer a student focused uh, way that, that hits neurodiversity, hits disabilities, hits people in different social and economic circumstances. So I feel really positive that as long as universities don't just fall back into the, the old normal and the, and the comfort zones, they've shown they can change, they've shown they can be much more student focused. And I think we need to embrace that. Thank you for that. And actually, uh, Mariam, before I turn it over to you, if some of you were listening into some of the sessions yesterday at the conference, some of these issues came up and um, Uthiyo Ray Chaudhary from the University of Denver shared the interesting experience that's playing out on campus now where students are back on campus and ostensibly have uh, available to them all of the same in-person options that used to exist earlier. But what they're finding is that very interestingly, students are choosing now to engage 
um, using technology and engage virtually to get a lot of their meetings done, which would have otherwise required a hike across campus. So even when that in-person opportunity is available, students are really themselves fashioning and tailoring an experience that that works for them. So Mariam, over to you. I know you you had your hand up. Very quick thing that it, we've also seen um, students with disabilities having a lot of needs right around closed captioning around uh, different readabilities of texts. Um, and not every university has been able to tailor towards that. And so accessibility is still, I feel, like a very big bridge that needs to be crossed over and that we haven't really gotten to. Uh, but it has really been exposed during this pandemic uh, around you know, the, the inequality of uh, access in the truest sense, you know, that even in extremely um, uh, affluent environments, uh, access is still a challenge, apart from internet and the other stuff. Absolutely. And, and so this sort of leads us um, back into kind of, I, I want to be mindful of time. So um, we've talked um, about the student experience, but I want to take it back to sort of the broader university level. And um, Adele, I want to turn to you and I'm going to ask you a broad question, but I invite your reflections on it because I think uh, you're the one person on this panel who's, as I said in your introduction, also straddled work in, in the MENA region as well as in, in North America. So um, Anne, Bean, Anne Bean, a senior leader overseeing internationalization for a campus. So I think that's a very specific perspective that you bring. So I would love to hear from you on how do universities like when we if we're getting down to the nuts and bolts of it how can universities really increase access increase inclusion democratize higher ed, international higher education and then within that if you would take a moment to also reflect on um this notion and here i'm raising the idea of the student again this prevailing notion sometimes that all students from the Gulf or MENA, MENA countries are affluent and wealthy and that these opportunities come very easily to them. But I'm sure that is not the case. And that's just true for, again, that's probably a stereotype or a biased view. So I'd love to sort of have you address that looking at these issues regionally as well. Yeah, thank you, Rajika. I think it's very, very important for all of us to understand uh, the student and uh, to know how we serve them. I do agree that we want to ask them and to, to listen to them, but also we need to recognize that sometimes they don't know. They are young and we are the leaders. We are the responsible to provide, to help them. So yes, we ask, but we need also to invent. We need to come to them with something new. We need, we need to really understand what I call their life project. We need to know why students, even Canadian students, are coming to Canadian universities. And by the way, actually, we have a few graduate students from Canada and Canadian universities, as you know. And we need to know, though, why they are coming to the university, what is their life project, especially if they are coming from abroad to Canada. I do uh, uh, argue that they don't come only to study. Some of them, they come just for the diploma. They want the grade and they want to go back home. But some of them, they want to stay in Canada or in the United States. Some of them, they want to learn, just to learn in not only chemistry or physics. They want to learn, the, they want to have the international experience. They want to know the culture. They want even to experiment the weather. And just let's remind ourselves that actually mobility, the, tra the, the travel, is also part of the culture in some countries. For example, as you know, as you said, I come from Lebanon, and do you know that the, the, there is a lot of Lebanese abroad? Uh, you know, they travel. It's really part of the culture. So, in this case, actually, Rajika, to, to, to answer your question, I think how the universities need to understand why students are coming to, to their programs and how to recruit them or how, how to serve them, how to make sure they are well served, they are well welcomed, and they succeed in their project, in their life uh, project, sometimes life-changing 
uh, uh, projects. In the context of today's pandemic and post-pandemic, actually, in the world, uh, I think students still want to travel. The mobility is there. Maybe we still have some barriers for traveling because of the public health, because of the airports, uh, because of the visas. And the connection now, actually, we can make very good use of the uh, broadband of connectivity to connect not students, but to connect universities, university to university. Let me share with you an example I really like. I have no role. I didn't, never played a role in this project, but I like the Egyptian Digital Egypt Builders Initiative. This initiative actually is made by the government of Egypt, the Minister of Telecommunication and Information Technology. So they decided to sign agreement with international universities in the United States, in Canada, in Singapore, in Korea. And they are connecting a technology university in Cairo to international universities. So students, they can prepare their masters in Cairo with professor and faculty and students in Canada or in Korea. The difference for me is very important here because this initiative is not only empowering students, it is also empowering faculty. It is also empowering a local university and the students not, are, are not studying from home, they are studying from a local university. So this is, I think, it's, it's really an empowering kind of initiative. It's kind of institutional competency, institutional capacity building initiative. And in my opinion, this kind of initiative actually will democratize global education, uh, not only by uh, allowing students to travel, but by opening the university, by opening the society, the local society, to an international uh, a university. And we can imagine that actually after one year or two years, students will be allowed to travel to Canada to complete a final year and to go back home and probably work in, in their society. So I think that we need this kind of innovative approaches now and not only providing individuals with a scholarship to go abroad, because unfortunately, sometimes this is the only way uh, we encourage uh, student mobility. I'm stressing here the role not of universities only, okay, but also the role of the, the, the authorities, because uh, as you know, students and universities, they need the support of, 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 the, of the authority of higher education. And there is a lot actually of a prerequisite I think we need to, to understand here. For example, yesterday, we gladly heard uh, Mr. Salama talk about the Association of Arab Universities, which is indeed a great association. He talked about the internationalization strategy, the internationalization plan provided by the association. I am really wondering to what extent this internationalization plan is deployed by universities. It is very good you know, framework, but we need to see uh, this kind of strategic plan actually implemented and deployed by individual universities. And this is, I think, how we democratize and how we maybe we open universities to, 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 to the others. We'll stop here. Now, thank you for that. And you raised so many excellent um, points in there. And I'll just quickly recap three. One was you, you, you alluded to the different motivations of students from different world regions. And this is absolutely key in all my years of re doing research in this space that that's sort of been the one big learning that the motivations of students from the global south are very different from students from other world regions and, and that are our approach to engaging them needs to respond to that. I loved your point about reminding us about not just focusing on the student as we think about internationalization, but it really needs to be that much broader strategy of institutions in one country collaborating and partnering with their peers and their counterparts in other parts of the world. And then the student mobility uh, in whatever shape or form is sort of one part of that eco ecosystem. And then the, the last point about national policy, I think that's absolutely critical, which would be a whole session unto <laughs> itself. So we're not going to have a lot of time to get into that today. And I want to also take some questions that are coming in. But I do want to pick up 
on sort of where you were going with some of your remarks. And Phil, um, turn it to you, um, staying with sort of that big picture on, um, you know, from your perspective, um, what, and from a measurement perspective, because you're doing so much work in the space around that, what is the mission and responsibility of universities around these broader issues of societal development, global development, and most obviously in the context of the sustainable um, development goals. And at the beginning of the conversation, Mariam and others had also talked about community building and development. So sort of taking it back to that point, and what is the broader responsibility and how do you see that in your work? And I know that you have um, tried to capture some of this in the social impact ranking. So I would love to hear more, more about that as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I do think there's been this really significant shift, actually, in, in universities' sense of their social responsibility. I mean, if you think about before the pandemic, I think there was the beginnings of a of quite an alarming sense of disengagement between universities and their communities, universities in large parts of society. You know, you've seen it in, in, in 2016 around, you know, the polarization of politics, the rise of you know, authoritarian governments, populist governments who tend to be anti-universities, anti-evidence, anti-science. Um, and I think that the, the pandemic, again, a bit like the, the, the idea of an equi-covery, the pandemic does give us a chance to reassess our university's relationship with society and to really, really fundamentally frame them as delivering public good. You know, universities were unbelievable in the pandemic, not just educating millions of students across the world and keeping the lights on, but actually developing the treatments for effective um, responses to the to COVID-19. Of course, highly symbolically delivering a vaccine, you know, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that will be the one that, that gets distributed around the world because it's much more cost effective and it's, it's distributed not for profit. Uh, Oxford led that. And of course, you know, you've got the Johns Hopkins data, you've got all the social scientists and the epidemiologists and the modeling and all the, the economists so universities have absolutely come into their own and saying, we are fundamental to the public good. We have a fundamental duty to make the world a better place. And of course, next step is, of course, the climate crisis. Universities will solve the greatest challenges that humanity faces through their knowledge creation, through their research, innovation, of course, through educating the next generation of, of leaders. So what's happened um, from our perspective as, as people who do rankings, and the Times Higher is far more than a ranking, but we do recognize we're very well known for our university rankings is that we've actually in 2019 just before the pandemic we started to try and capture measures of this social impact to say okay if you're harvard or stanford or oxford you've got a certain mission let's measure how many nobel prizes you've got let's measure your position in the knowledge economy but let's also fundamentally look at universities public duty their responsibilities to society and we didn't think there was a better more coherent more comprehensive framework than the sdgs so the times higher impact rankings were set up in 2019 we measure universities against each and every one of the 17 sustainable development goals. And it's wonderful because that can be very niche. It can be about climate science. It can be about life under underwater. It can be about food security and eradicating poverty. But it also can be about gender equality. It can be about equalities in general, about widening access. So we can measure universities on their direct contribution. We look at research, of course, new knowledge creation to help tackle these issues. But we also look at stewardship. What do, you, what do universities themselves do with their own campuses, with their own faculty, with their own student body to live those values? So are they taking new first generation students? Are they taking a diverse range of students? Are they promoting enough women and minorities into senior leadership roles? We're capturing all that data now. Um, so we're really, really excited that we have a new framework, a new way of understanding excellence. And we hope not only will it recognize great work that's being done, but will incentivize more work in this direction. And just a final point on that is that it has been embraced very, very, very dramatically by the global community. In year one, 2019, we had about 500 universities. They have to volunteer. They have to give us a lot of data. It's rather onerous. Um, in 2021, uh, during the pandemic, we had 1,200 and we've got data collection open right now for next year's ranking. So even though there's whole huge amounts of distraction and challenge to the day job, we're, we're on course to see many, many hundreds of more universities joining what I think is a global movement and a really healthy way of saying 
there's not one type of excellence. Let's not look at a single ranking to say who's better than someone else. It's all about using different data sets, different metrics to understand different types of performance. But this feels like a really positive opportunity to rethink how we understand excellence and pivot that towards social and economic impact and, and the wider public good. Such an important effort, um, I will say, and, and so needed. And uh, kudos to you all for really spearheading that and taking it beyond the more traditional uh, metrics of, uh, of excellence. And uh, I'll just say that tomorrow we have the closing. I'm sorry, not tomorrow. Later today, we have the closing keynote by, um, by Jamil Salmi. And he's, of course, an expert in many of these issues. So. Um, so that'll be a great one to tune into as well. So we have a few minutes left and I want to take questions that are coming in. There are questions coming in around student motivation and engagement. So we have a couple of questions around that. So I'm going to put them together and frame them uh, a little differently. And um, I, I guess the question is that especially in this time of so much shift and tumult, um, so much changing, the role of technology, et cetera. How can those who are interfacing directly with students, in this case, faculty, as well as others, how can they um, keep students motivated, keep students engaged? So that's the question that's been coming up. So I will offer it up for anybody who wants to, um, to go first. I'll, I'll defer to my colleagues who work inside universities. <laughs> um, I can go if you want. Um, so uh, I guess one thing is to make sure that students feel empowered so they can sell, they themselves can challenge their own ideas. Um, if they feel like they can't challenge your ideas and question what you're saying in the classroom, um, they're not going to be able to really have the ability to question them their own selves and that's where innovation really is uh, I, I think is born um and so this I, I think we need to get away from this idea that the professor is standing in front of the room delivering information that cannot be questioned um and that, that's my opinion um but uh let and also let students be more in a decision making position where they uh, give them the second to understand what you're like, if you say, I'm going to do this or this way, giving the one more sentence explanation of why and an opportunity to at, let them add to that narrative is, I think, really, really important. Um, I think it's also important to put expectations up really, really early. And so you can't, I, I, I think you need to have all your assignments and everything out the very beginning of the semester so people can have time to process it and then also ask questions so they're not doing it the last second when they're in the middle of midterms. So sort of little nuanced things. Um, but I think it's also really important that technology is really excellent in providing access and it's a critical tool. Um, also, people need to connect and we need to invest in better understanding this balance. I think we have to remember that we're, you know, we have this COVID-19 disaster that through technology in the classroom and we all adapted really, really fast, but we still need to look back and say, humans need to be with other humans and we need to balance what those opportunities are so that we're using technology in the right way and in the best way for the students' experience. Um, and just believe in students as an innovator and that they and know that they can do things you can't and that's okay. Um, I think a little bit of vulnerability and faculty goes millions of miles in letting students be part of the um, change that we all want to see in the world. Thank you, Mariam. You want to go? We have a few minutes left, so let's go for quick responses, Mariam, and then you, Adele. Just building on Rebecca's piece, right? That we need to recognize the fact that we are in this pandemic, we are where we are, mostly because of our own self-created problems. And our students know that. And so the university has this, this tremendous responsibility at this point to really talk about things like land education, things like indigenous and traditional wisdoms, things like what we have done to this planet and why it's not simply the SDGs as pillars, but the SDGs as a nested approach that is necessary where we are society that is economy that is ensconced in society that is ensconced in the environment and that we are all connected and as indigenous communities have constantly told us we are all related 
and unless we and there has not been a point where this has been starker and more obvious than now and so we need to bring that back because the students see that we keep trying to shy away from it but these are things we need to come back to and recognize and acknowledge and then give students the opportunity and the space to be the ones that go in and understand those problems deeply rely on their wisdom really believe in them and allow them to take that space and then come up with community based solutions that actually make sense thank you thank you for that adel you get the last word on this <laughs> thank you uh, i think also we need to help students succeed again in their life projects and we need to give them the example we need them we need to show them the example and not only to say you can do it we can to show we need to show them we need to provide uh, i would what i would call rejuvenated programs and new programs we cannot tell them come here you will become a global citizen and my university but the only efforts i do for sdg is to appear higher on the on phil uh, ranking actually the sdg sdgs as example could be the framework for our education and i do believe that we are still as universities we need more uh, programs adapted programs and new programs programs with integrated global citizenship values for example and not only talking about environment and uh, climate change and i do believe that we need the strong institutions we need the strong programs we need the strong leaders courageous leaders if you want to have successful students and successful uh, future citizens thank you so much adel and what a strong statement and i i can't i can't think of a better note um, to end on um, that you know i think we've covered uh, such a um, wide spectrum in this panel on looking at these issues of access and inclusion from a number of different viewpoints the roles uh, role and responsibilities of universities um, in creating social change agents we've looked at students um, and um, and the diversity of learners and i think one of the key takeaways is there's no one magic bullet or one single solution but it uh, really those solutions are going to um, look different in different uh, parts of the world and on different campuses and, and for different groups of learners. So with that, um, I want to thank everybody who joined us um, today to listen to our session. And I want to thank all of our wonderful uh, panelists, uh, Phil Beatty, Rebecca Brenner, Maria Moidun Emmet, and uh, Adele Elzaim. Thank you so much for, um, for a great conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Day.